So I will give a bit more of a geologic, a uh, longer time perspective on, on the issues um, and, and reiterate some of the uh, points that I've made. Um, one of the key things, of course, is there's no question that we have, you know, CO2 is rising exceedingly rapidly. I'll come back a little later to this um, Holocene sea, uh, rise in CO2, but um, the key, one of the key points of what I'm trying to make is it's the rate of change of CO2 that's, that's a, a, one of the major problems. And of course we um, well understand the cause for this and that's our demand for energy and this shows our current uh, day distribution, um, or globally at least, of energy sources. And Australia plays a key role, for example, in coal and increasingly in um, gas, natural gas, um, and much less so in other sources. Um, I'm going to focus on, well, okay, coral reefs are in the oceans, but the oceans themselves are a key part of this whole process. And there's a very simple reason for that, and that's because if you look at where carbon is, sits now, um, we have 39,000 gigatons of carbon sitting in the total oceans. The atmosphere only has 750, and on the continents, a, a few thousand. Now, a very important point about the oceans is the, is the residence time and mixing rates of the oceans. The reason we have a problem is that most of the, the uptake of CO2 via these sort of reaction that I've described is in the surface waters, uh, which are equilibrating with the at atmosphere over a few years. But it's only the upper part of the oceans that are seeing this effect. Eventually, this effect will wash down into the deeper oceans over periods, mid-oceans, hundreds of years, deeper oceans, thousands of years. And in fact, there's enough carbon, three million tonnes in the ocean sediments to take care of our problem. But the problem is that that's not accessible over mil until millions of years time scale, in which case the relevance to us sitting here is a bit irrelevant. You know, obviously, that's not a... Um, thing. So the Earth does have a natural um, way to deal with CO2 emissions, but the time scales are much longer than, than what we're doing now. That's, so that's the uh, time scale issue. Now we've had problems of, well, dealing with climate sceptics, and, and I thought, and we're talking about the oceans, so why, it's very easy to show why, um, or our, our understanding of, of warming of the oceans, the key, the, one of the, which is the key reservoir. So the oceans is the most important sink for heat. It's taken up over two thirds of the um, heat. If we didn't have the oceans there now, things would be two or three times worse, and they've taken up nearly half the CO2. So we're talking about the CO2 rise here, um, <clears throat> but there are other negative forcing factors that we have to be aware of. CO2 sits around for thousands of years, but we also have volcanism. This shows in this blue curve, for example. So that puts sulphate up in the atmosphere. It acts, acts as a blanket and it reflects heat or incoming solar radiation and cools. Now those gases sit around only for, for they have residence times of several years. Um, so for example, the effect of volcanism, uh, this is the Mount Pinatubo effect, is a short term decrease in temperatures, but then the global temperatures rise again. Now, it has been suggested by some people, well, what, all we need to do is put more sulphate up in the air, right, in the, in the troposphere. But the problem is, of course, this makes acid rain. So not only would we have to deal with acidity of the oceans, we'd have acid rain permanently. So that isn't a solution. But the point of this slide, though, is to show that all the forcing factors are very well understood. Um, when you look at the balance between CO2, there's also solar radiation, for example. Um, the models can very well now reproduce the fine-scale detail of global warming in the, on, in the surface oceans. So the modelling, I think, and the IPCC4 report um, shows that we have a quite a thorough and sound understanding of the processes. And we can model the details, which I think is very important. Now this curve is for temperature. We do not have a similar curve for acidity or pH changes in the oceans. And I'll come back to that. And this is one of the reasons I think we've not really appreciated this problem and it snuck up on us because we don't have long-term records of pH and that's one of the issues that uh, research that I've tried to do to, to rectify that. Now the oceans, of course, um, they've taken up CO2. Obviously, cost of higher temperatures, ocean acidification we're talking about, and of course also increased sea levels, which uh, I won't address in this talk. Um, I will skip through this slide, but Ove has already pointed out to the different scenarios for warming, and these correspond, correspond to different scenarios for CO2 emissions. Um, 
Obviously, the major uncertainty in which scenario we follow is largely dependent on which, which heating, which temperature scenario we follow depends on which CO2 path we go. I should point out in Ove's talk, and it showed very well, that there are uncertainty bands, and those probability functions, if you looked at them, they tend to be, um, there's no question about, they're rather robust on the lower level, but some of those functions have wide, flat curves, and it's not impossible, in fact, that the, uncertain, the probability of higher temperatures than predicted by the centroid of those probability functions um, is, is there is a, a finite probability, e.g. for this higher curve, for example, there's a 10% probability, the, the probability distribution is rather flat, that we could have much higher temperatures than that's even predicted. So that's a thing to, to bear in mind. Now the other thing with this issue of acidity is to look up look where is the CO2 being taken up. Now the oceans isn't a simple thing. It actually takes up CO2 and it releases CO2. On balance it's taking up about CO2 and it's taking up roughly half our anthropogenic emissions, but not spatially in a uniform manner. It's obviously taken it up where the water is colder. So on the edge of the Antarctic ice sheet, this area through here, is where the major uptake has occurred, as well as of course up in the northern hemisphere. There's also areas where it's being released. In the central Pacific, where there's upwelling waters, in these red areas, there's actually release of CO2. So when we're trying to look at this problem, we can't just do one measurement. We have to try and understand this dynamic ocean, which is breathing and releasing, taking up CO2 and releasing it. The other point that I've made is that... Um, oops. Sorry, I've gone back the wrong way. Um, is that if you look at the longer term geologic record, we're in a very, very unusual time. Our CO2 levels are off the graph of these ice cores, the Epica ice cores. Today we're at 380, that's not even on scale here. Now I've done a lot of work on last interglacial corals, looking at their distributions, and the last interglacial PCO2 was about 300 ppm. So we've already surpassed that level. So we can't use distributions of last interglacial corals to give us an idea of where they can retreat to because the PCO2 is already much higher than it was in the last interglacial. I'll just briefly describe um, uh, this, this, the acidification problem, and I'll refer to a, a diagram because I want to show you a bit more detail about that. So these, these, these are the simple dissolution of CO2 uh, in, into seawater, reacts with water and carbonate iron to form bicarbonate. It's interesting, however, to look a little, little bit more detail at the actual this diagram here, which is a phase diagram showing the proportion of species versus pH. Seawater sits just above 8 in pH units, and this is the distribution of carbonate ions. It's on the downward slope, so only a very small proportion of, of, um, of carbon is in the carbonate form. Most of it is sitting in the bicarbonate form, and even a small amount in the um, carbonic acid form. And of course, the, as I've pointed out, the critical thing for corals is that calcification depends on the combination of concentration of carbonate ion and actually also calcium, but calcium is, in, is effectively in an infinite supply in the ocean, so it's not limited by calcium, it's limited by the carbonate ion. And we're sitting on this cusp here that as we, de as we um, make oceans more acidic, this way we're driving towards lower and lower, lower carbonate ion. And the calculations, you can do a rough calculation on this. And the point that I've made again is that um, <clears throat> if we look at levels pre-industrial, we had about over 220 ppm of uh, carbonate. And we've now almost, if you double CO2 at the 560 level, you'll, over, you'll almost halve the carbonate ion concentration because you're moving rapidly down this curve. The change in bicarbonate is quite insignificant because it's the dominant form and you just switch a little bit of this carbonate into the bicarbonate. So the main effect of acidification is actually on the levels of carbonate and this shows roughly the uh, kind of 0.3 to 0.4 pH unit shift that that will um, uh, cause. And again, uh, this is the same diagram showing the dependence of calcification on carbonate iron that, that I've showed. So clearly it's a critical thing for coral calcification. <clears throat> now this is a diagram from Ken Caldera showing 
the, a predicted effect for a global acidification, for how the whole of Earth's, the world's ocean uh, will, will, will react. So if we do something like, here's, the, here's our emissions, we burn all the fossil fuel we have, right? We drive up PCO2 up into the thousands of ppm range, and it actually sits around for thousands of years, 3,000 years, so we're looking at very long time scales. Points out that CO2, once it's in the atmosphere, it takes a long, long time to draw down. This curve is actually slightly wrong. The, the minus point pH unit shift has not yet gone down to the deep oceans. It's still relatively shallow, but we'll head down to the deep oceans over the next um, few hundred years. So he's sort of got not quite, this should still be uh, a line along like this and then downwards because it hasn't yet got into the deep oceans. And you can see how that we can get shifts of pH in the surface oceans of quite large amounts if we burn all our fossil fuel, 0.7 pH units, which would be a horrendous uh, ecological consequences. But it does show that it's a surface effect and there's long time scales involved. Of course, um, the issue not only affects corals, but uh, plankton. And in fact, if you look at the, how the oceans work and breathe, there's two major forces. There's a so-called by logic pump to help draw down CO2. So this is showing CO2 in the atmosphere, production in the surface waters. Uh, they die, sink, and eventually carbon is deposited on ocean floors. And that's one of the mechanisms, the biologic mechanism for drawing down CO2. We could cut off this part of this pump if we uh, dissolve up our calcium carbonate bearing organisms. So that, how that will work, well, we just don't know in detail yet. The other thing is a so-called chemical physical pump. Uh, this is where deep water forms, drawing down CO2 on the edge of those ice sheets, which I showed you earlier. Obviously, if global warming occurs, we don't have um, ice melt at the, in the Antarctic, then this physical pump will be uh, inhibited. We'll also probably um, <clears throat> not only reduce the deep water formation, the oceans may become more stratified generally, and therefore um, there won't be as much communication between the deeper waters and the atmosphere, again, that will cause um, a, the, will sort of isolate the deeper oceans from the atmosphere, which again will inhibit the drawdown of CO2. Now, just a thing I was looking at the other night, I looked at Terry's diagram of distribution of coral reefs, and Ove's actually shown a more detailed version of what Ken Caldera has been saying. But if you just ask a simple question, is there a relationship between ocean acidification, this is a pH diagram, a snapshot of the oceans, and where coral reefs sit. Well, obviously, coral reefs are de dependent on, on, on temperature, the high latitude, tropic zones here, they are rough boundaries. But it's quite interesting, if you look in detail, that, for example, we have um, the blue is low pH waters on, in, in the Western Pacific, or in, the, in this part of the Eastern Pacific, I should say, and there's very few coral reefs around this area. Um, the distribution of coral reefs out in the Pacific is large, as we see here, is largely seems to be controlled by this somewhat higher pH unit. So the first order, we, I would say that um, obviously temperature is an important component, but carb, um, pH or carbonate ion concentration is manifestly also important in the distribution of reefs, just from looking at present day distributions. <clears throat> So what are the outstanding questions we have to look at and, and consider? Well, the first question is, what is the impact on coral reef today of the acidification level that we're now at? Can we start to see this effect already? As, as I've said, we've obviously put this amount of um, PCO2 or CO2 in the atmosphere. Can we see that effect? And obviously, then, what are the longer term implications? Now, there's one simplification that I gave, um, is that when you actually form a coral, calcium carbonate, the complete reaction is shown actually here. That when you actually produce calcium carbonate, you release CO2. So there's, people may not understand this, but there's this kind of a positive benefit. <coughs> I should say, sorry, the reverse reaction, that um, when you convert calcium carbonate, it takes the CO2 atom and converts it into this bicarbonate form so that when we produce coral reefs, we actually draw down CO2. We, sorry, when we produce coral, I'm getting myself confused. <laughs> when we produce coral reefs, make calcium carbonate, we, re, re, we um, 
increase the CO2. So if you dissolve coral reefs, you'll actually draw down CO2. This is what this reaction says. Now, actually, there's some evidence for this, that in the Holocene um, period around here, uh, that's when a lot of the coral reefs expanded. And there's always been this enigma about CO2 levels, shown here, about 10 to 20 ppm. What's caused this? This may well be the, as a result of forming the Holocene coral reefs. They actually released extra CO2 of about 20 ppm level. Now, the reverse can be used as an argument that if we dissolve all our coral reefs, they're going to be the buffer. How much does it give us for CO2 for the atmosphere? Well, the bad news, it's only about 20 ppm. <laughs> we'll draw it, if we dissolve all our Holocene reefs, we'll draw down CO2 by about 20 ppm, which I'm not going to say, not going to help very much at all. So that's the bad news about this uh, reverse buffer reaction, which I didn't explain very well to you. Now, what we've gone off to do now is use coral cores to try and figure out are we seeing an effect now in coral reefs of this current era of acidification where we're now at? Let's see if we can see what's happening. So what we did was to go out and um, use some coral cores, and I should say we've got a student from the University of Queensland, Guy Marion, and actually an Ames worker, Tim Cooper, out helping us uh, take a core from Arlington Reef just off, off Cairns. And we've taken this core and looked at both annual increments and five-year increments. Now, we've used a nice trick of geochemistry that turns out boron has a very similar uh, geochemical distribution in seawater as carbonate ions. That's why I went to the trouble to explain that to you. So if you look at the distribution of boron in seawater, it has two complexes, a borate, shown this black line, and also a boric acid, and this black line. And it turns out nature's provided us with this nice little uh, geochemical fingerprint because most of corals take up the borate ion. It also turns out that there's an isotope fractionation between these two forms. So simple, light, simple story is that the boron isotopic composition we measure in a coral is pH dependent. So we now have this proxy for pH that can take us back through the age of this core. And we decided to use this. So the very first work, and it still is the only published work yet known of, um, is we looked at Flinders Reef off the Great Barrier Reef. We chose that because um, we thought it was away from the main reef um, function and should tell us about the big ocean story. The very first bit of data shows, well, there's two bits of data here that are of interest. We've also measured the carbon isotopic composition in the coral, and you can see that this core, which I think is in the green, and there's other data shown from other locations. Yeah, Flinders Reef is green. There's something from Jamaica that to remind Terry of home and uh, another uh, core from Vanuatu. And you see the systematic decrease in carbon isotopic composition. That's easily explained by the fact that when we burn fossil fuel, the fossil fuel has a different isotopic composition than the atmosphere does. So what's happening, it tells us immediately that uh, this carbon has been, this fossil fuel carbon, which has a low isotopic composition, has been taken up into the surface waters. Not a surprising result, because we've no that it's already, the oceans have already taken up 40%. And in fact, this data is one of the bits of data that prove that. The pH for our first record um, went back to about late 1990s. It shows these oscillations. A suggestion of some decrease um, in, in pH from our boron measurements, but not a very strong kind of thing, but a lot more variation than we expected, showing that the natural variability was much larger than we expected. What we've done now is go off to Arlington Reef in front of Cairns, probably the, the biggest one. It, this reef and nearby reefs are the most important for the tourism. Um, again, the carbon signature is very clear. The so-called Zeus effect, we can see the uptake of fossil fuel carbon in, into the corals very, very simply. The pH, the boron work now, shows this kind of very, somewhat, we see the systematic, and this is still unpublished data, but general, there's some noise here, but there's now a very clear decrease in pH in the last uh, 40 years. This decrease is from about 8 to about 7.6. This is way too large, actually. It's 0.4 pH units. Um, so there's two problems. We don't, well, first, we have to figure out what the hell's going on, but why is it? What's causing some of this variation? We don't know yet. I suspect it may actually be a flood plumes that are impacting Arlington Reef, which you can see from the latest satellite data, the 207, 207 flood. There may be some subtleties in our calibration for boron isotopes, which we have to sort out, and we're going to work with Ove on trying to get better calibrations. But 
the, the bad news, well, the first point to make is corals are now seeing the effect of ocean acidification. The Great Barrier Reef corals, we can now demonstrate it. Here is the pH change, a little larger than we expected. <laughs> so there's a problem. You know, we can't just walk away. We are now seeing the effect of putting CO2 in the atmosphere. It's affecting the seawater pH, clearly affecting the carbon isotopic composition. And what does this mean? I mean, it's, I would have thought we'd see a tenth of a pH unit. We've worked very hard to make these measurements more precise, but the variations have allowed a factor of two larger, a factor of two to three larger than we expected. So that's ongoing bit of research, and we're about to publish it in Nature soon or somewhere, some journal like that. And um, presumably there'll be a request to Grumper about how we're going to deal with this problem. So you, you cannot say you're not forewarned. <coughs> anyway, there is now the question of the future impacts. This is the next issue we have to think about. And I very nicely showed the, the data of uh, Caldera. And basically, the predictions are, as I've shown, this is a different way to show it, percent calcification is that zones where we can now calcify, uh, which is here historically, this is where we are now. Well, sorry, that's 1990. Uh, below, yep. Um, we're going to run into zones where the calcification is going to diminish, and if the OVs write about the 200 ppm limit on carbonate iron, they will disappear. I mean, my own view is that's probably variable from species to species, but and a lot more work needs to be done on that lower limit. It's a real key question. So this is um, obviously a serious long-term problem. Now, we shouldn't think about these problems in isolation. I've done a lot of work looking at local impacts, and actually the acidification is part of the whole global change problem. My view is you still have to take into account and think about all the local impacts, and obviously if we can make the system as healthy and resilient as possible now, it'll give us time to perhaps keep the CO2 lid uh, fixed tight and give the corals you know, some chance to respond and rebound to these high PCO2 effects. Um, I'll give a little bit of, I mean, there's obvious societal implications for this. Um, clearly, we have to look at enhancing resilience of reefs in a, in a local, specific manner, overfishing, sedimentation, nutrient discharge, reduce the CO2 emissions. Now, the CO2 emissions, this is a diagram taken of world energy use predicted out to 2100. There's actually two ways I th can, you can think about this. We're sitting here around about this point, 2000, a bit above. Um, the prediction is, I think it's very cautious, is that we'll double energy needs by 2100. I'd say that's a very uh, optimistic estimate. Um, <clears throat> actually, crude oil and natural gas, we're going to burn them out anyway, right? <coughs> actually, I don't think. Um, the main concern is can we replace, instead of being dominated by these types of fuels, with alternatives such as solar wind, geothermal, nuclear? The, for Australia, the issue is coal. There's no question that our economy is based strongly on coal and it's almost certain that the rest of the world and Australia will be burning lots of coal. The question is, how do we burn it? And obviously, I think things such as sequestration, carbon capture of coal are absolutely essential. And my impression is the coal industry of Australia has got a fair way to go uh, to uh, come to grips with this problem. Uh, thanks very much. We'll have time for a few questions.